and think the uh, AGI will be a transformer architecture. Wait. Uh, yeah, thanks, Martin, for uh, all of the uh, explanations. That was really good. I just have a question since, um, let's say, you mentioned that, uh, let's say, the LLMs are most likely like a simulation of the broca area in the brain. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking, since, like, other areas of the brain don't have this, like, outward, outward expression such as language some, or something similar to that, is it, do you think there's going to be a bottleneck uh, for, like, let's say, getting to AGI because we don't have, like, outward expression of those areas of the brain? For instance, we have outward expression of, uh, let's say, images, we have outward expression of movements, but uh, let's say something as abstract as uh, creativity or, like, Reasoning might be like harder to replicate based on what you're explaining. Yeah, that's a really wise um, statement. Um, my engineer, head of engineering, uh, and I had this discussion today where I was trying to um, talk about making this whole new module that, that some people are working on, some people aren't. It's not a popular idea, but trying to make an ontology system that um, GPT or any other LLM can kind of interface with, and we joke that we call it the corpus callosum, which is you know famously you know kind of the the piece of brain that divides the two hemispheres. And so you, you're right that like these abstract concepts, like we don't even know how we store them in our own brains. And there's concepts that are that transcend language, um, love, instinct, fear, you know things like that. And what I've tried to do is is make this like biomimetic <laughs> framework. Um, I'm starting it up in this thing called Hume, uh, which is, you know, pun on, on David Hume, of course, but also Human Emulator, where I'm trying to sort of like put the state object where you actually have these like neurohormonal variables that will, that the AGI or the agentic agent or whatever will sort of have this like, you know, state of dopamine and state of, you know, norepinephrine and state of all the other biological things that, you know, I'm familiar with. and try to keep that, you know, fidelity to humankind and see if some emergent behavior happens. Because, like, we have emergent behavior because of some of these neurotransmitters, and they're very vague. And if you think about, like, a neural network, those layers go from abstract to or, or very non-abstract to abstract and, and maybe back again. And I think that for us, you know, we have these very simple sort of tools, whether it's dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine, we have the expression of their receptors, we have Jeep protein coupled receptors, they send a signal, but all that signal transduction is kind of, you know, gives rise to this really emergent behavior where dopamine gives rise to movement, but also psychosis, uh, and serotonin gives rise to a whole bunch of stuff. And so can we get emergent behavior by, by maybe synthetically mapping neurotransmitters? I'm not sure they even need to be named, um, but I think that, you know, if you prescribe it too much, you, you get into this problem of you're, you're building something that's not artificial intelligence, or at least machine learning. But I also think you might still get the emergent behavior. So even if you have to hack it, it, it could be worth it. So in terms of, of, of things like love and, and abstract concepts that the brain doesn't do well with, like olfactory stuff, right, where, where you're talking about a scent that, you know, you can remember. I have scents that I remember that take me back 20 years, you know, the very specific smell. Now that kind of comes back from our, like, animal, you know, uh, upbringing. Uh, we're still animals, but the evolutionary kind of fight to to sort of, you know, be able to smell things and remember um, where your meal was or where, you know, something like that was for survival. Um, in a lot of ways, a lot of those substrates are a little antiquated, and I wonder if you can actually do fine with just language. So what I'm practicing is this thing called uh, the MUD, which was popular in the 80s um, as a text-based sort of world where you can simulate quite a bit of uh, reality with verbs and it's a text-only interface. Now MUDs have evolved, of course, to RPGs and MMORPGs like World of Warcraft, where you can really live out a life in there that's fairly close to the reality. You can sit down if you want to sit down. I forgot how you do that in World of Warcraft, but I think you type forward slash sit. Um, and you see your character sitting down. But that's all superfluous. An intelligent agent only needs to sort of simulate doing that, right? The actual visuals of it are just for our pleasure. And in a text-based version, which was this MUD, system, multi-user dungeon, I think it was, um, which I started playing uh, on Telnet in the 90s. Uh, basically, there was this, uh, you know, way to sort of simulate most of reality. And again, just like in AOL Instant Messenger, 
you can get a pretty good sense for, you know, a human actor kind of emoting using different um, emotional verbs. Uh, some of the better months have like a thousand verbs and you can really express yourself just like um, you were, you could express yourself in a 3D MMORPG, maybe even better. So I think that, um, you know, there's, there's sort of a tool there uh, that I've been using to try to like get agentic behavior out of a, a necessarily stateless machine. I do think there'll be time, like the stuff that Yohi's doing and the stuff that I'm doing is very prescriptive and it's very like human directed. Whereas I think like reinforcement learning may actually be a much better sort of tool. And I think that you can combine the two. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying like, for me, I, I try to use homeostasis that if, if the dopamine level of the machine goes up too much that then maybe they have to move to lower it or maybe they have to do some sexual thing to lower it or something like that. And that's all things that we laugh, but like that is how we're wired, right? Um, you know, what, what makes us, you know, our libido go up, what makes our hunger go up, what makes our thirst go up. All those things are kind of regulated by, you know, this sort of hierarchy of, of, of needs that it's not Meslowian, but it's more Minsky. And, you know, Marvin Minsky was the, the pioneer in, in AI. A lot of people don't like him. But, um, you know, he talked about the, the brain context switching amongst different sub-modules. And I think we have a really good Broca's area in the, in the LLM, but I don't know that we have a good area for, for like, you know, some of the prefrontal cortex and things like that. So I hope that, you know, helps touch on some of this. I really don't have a great answer to your actual question, which is, you know, how do we get a better sense for these ephemeral or indescribable, I should say, is probably better, uh, or tough to describe kind of, you know, um, feelings and moods, um, things like that that can't be reduced to language easily. The good thing about language is that I think some people are talking about this, including our, our EAC founder, uh, Beth Jezos, that there are ways to reduce virtually anything to language. <laughs> that if something contains information, sort of the Claude Shannon um, way of looking at it, that, that language can contain it. And I think that may be true. So my hope is that you know, you can use language as sort of like a, a parallel reflector of any sort of state. Um, but that doesn't mean it'll be useful or easy or, or like perfect. And so, I don't know, do you think there's um, a solution to what you're talking about? Or can you like pin it down a little bit better uh, so that we can think about it better? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have some experience like with HCIs and uh, human basically human brain interaction and human uh, basically machine interaction and uh, to be honest uh, that's basically like uh, what I'm probably going to do is to go and probably get into Neuralink because I believe that like what they have can be used to basically train like uh, machine learning models directly on the like the human I mean it's not actual human brain activity it's just the EEG signal and like the electrical signal or ECG more accurate let's say but to be honest I think none of these words accurately describe what uh, Neuralink has but let's say the abstract the way um, kind of uh, signals that we get from uh, the neural activation in the, in the human brain what they have uh, might be uh, we might be able to use that to train let's say uh, AI models to get like a let's say closer to AGI I mean it is true that language can describe like a lot of stuff but my personal opinion is that despite it being a really good way of representing things uh, the representation it uh, itself is not necessarily let's say how the brain represents that information like there's going to be a significant level of let's say abstraction from, from the actual like perception and the quality of that happens in the human brain so that is the direction that I'm hoping to take to get into Neuralink learn how the things work hopefully like maybe start my own company related to that but that is what I think what do you think Martin? Yeah no I, I think that makes a lot of sense I think there's there's I mean I personally feel like uh sort of the, the brain machine interfaces or, you know, there's so many different acronyms for them, but the uh, computer, <laughs> let's see, what, what is the, the number one acronym people use? I think it's brain computer interface, BCI. BCI, yeah. Yeah, yeah BCI. The, um, the BCIs to me are like, I'm not a huge fan of them, but we can talk about that offline. But the, I, I do think like spiritually, I'm in agreement with you when I think like, there's no better place to look than the greatest computer ever made. Three pounds, 10 watts. 
um, very, very, very good engineering. Uh, so yeah, I think you know there's there's definitely clues in the human brain that we should we should go back to. And AI has moved very far. Machine learning has moved very far from the brain, um, and you know there's almost yeah virtually no similarity between what we do in machine learning or what they do. I should say it's not me. <laughs> what, what great machine learning. Uh, researchers do and and neuroscience is, is they've just you know maybe touched uh, fifty years ago but they've they've so far removed from each other at this point that there's no point in using any of these sort of like neural network is probably you know for example a uh, you know a, a, a term that that probably should get renamed um, so I think that you know we should probably go back to some of those roots and think about you know what the solution is so to me that's like a high risk high reward strategy I'd be remiss if I didn't mention we have the beautiful and brilliant Tiffany here. I uh, just wanted to say hi. Oh my God, you're so nice. You sound very brilliant. I have nothing, nothing uh, insightful to add to this, but it's fun doing you talk. Thank you. Um, so let's see. Uh, I can't say we have a mutual friend because you know somebody that everybody wants to know right now. And um, I don't know, like, uh, I don't want to ask you about it if you don't want to talk about it. So... <laughs> Oh, you can ask me about it. I, I am an Uber, so I'm somewhat limited in what I can <laughs> talk about, but um, you can ask me about it if you want. Yeah, so I mean, I was in a similar position to, to Sam, probably, so we're talking about Sam Bankman-Fried, 